Hello YouTube, this is Eric from Coder Snacks. Today, we're going to talk about making chains of words. Let's get started. Graph problems appear all the time, in high-end programming and in interviews. The more you're familiar with trees and graphs, the more you will see them as useful coding tools. Today, we'll discuss two ways to search a graph, breadth-first search and depth-first search. Let's start with a few clarifying questions. What's the size of our word list? What letters can we expect in the dictionary? Lowercase a through z, uppercase, punctuation, spaces, unicode? What should we do if there are no paths between the words? For our purposes, we'll say the word list is dictionary-sized, maybe 100,000 to 200,000 words. The words will be all lowercase a through z, and if there's no path, we'll return none. First, how is this a graph problem? In a previous episode, we said that graph vertices are things, and edges are the connections between the things. We can think of the words as things, and the ability to go to a word from another word as the edge. In our case, an edge connects two words if there is a single add, remove, or change that lets us transform one word to the other. Here is a very small portion of the graph. For example, flood is connected to floor, blood, and floods, among other words in the actual graph. This graph is undirected. We can go from flood to floor in one move, but also floor to flood. To make this graph, we need a way to check the neighbors of a word. How can we do that? The straightforward way would be to check every word in the dictionary and see if it's one different from our current word. But this is at least O of length of the dictionary. Can we do better? A better approach is to generate every possible neighbor and see which ones work. That seems like a lot of wasted work, but it turns out to be far less work than checking every word in a normal sized dictionary. For our problem, we'll insert a letter into every position, which is O of length of word, since the length of our alphabet is constant. Next, we'll change every letter in the word, which is also O of length of word, and finally we'll delete each letter, which is also O of length of word. The total approach is O of the length of the word. The constant is in the 50s, two runs through the alphabet plus one, but that's far less than the size of a normal dictionary. This will check a few hundred words, whereas the other way will check over a hundred thousand. Let's write a function to do this. We make a set to hold our neighbors. We need a set instead of a list because we can generate some of the possibilities multiple times. We'll start by adding a letter in each position in the word. We have to go to length plus one because we also want to append a letter at the end. If the word we create is in our word set, we add it to neighbors. Next, we remove each letter from the word and check all of those. Finally, we change each letter in the word and check those. Changing a letter is kind of a cross between adding and removing a letter. We're effectively removing each letter and inserting a different one. At the end, we return our set. When we test it, we see it works. We see a word where we removed the L to get food, we added a letter to get floods, and we changed letters to get floor and blood. Interesting is that flood, the word itself, is in the list as well, because we change a letter to itself. We could remove the word itself at the end, but it will turn out not to matter for reasons we'll see later. Now that we have a neighbor function, let's move on to the graph portion. We want the shortest path between the start and end vertices. We can search the graph using breadth-first search or depth-first search. Which should we use? First, what are they? Here's a random graph. Say we're starting at A, and we're going to some goal node. In a depth-first search, from a start node, we'll go to one of our neighbors, then from that neighbor, we'll immediately go to another neighbor, and so on until we hit a dead end, where we'll back up until we can go to another neighbor, and so on. We'll track the neighbors we visited on this path to avoid cycles. This is called depth first. We go deep into the graph first before exploring other, closer neighbors. Breadth first is the opposite. We start at a node and visit all of its neighbors. Then we visit those neighbors' neighbors and so on. We visit all of the neighbors of our current node before visiting any of those nodes' neighbors. We go broad first before going deep. Both of these have advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage of depth-first search is space used. Going back to DFS for a moment, we'll use a stack to implement where we go next. We begin by putting our start node on the stack. Then we repeat, popping a node off the stack, adding its neighbors onto the top of the stack, and so on. 
In this example, we pop A off and add B, C, D, E, and F. Then we pop B off and add G and K. We pop G and add H and R, and so on. Since we're always popping from the top of the stack, we're visiting new neighbors nodes first. How much space does this take? For a graph where, on average, each vertex has n edges, at k levels deep, our stack will have O of n times k items on it, n nodes for each of k levels. In breadth-first search, instead of a stack, we use a queue. Again, we put the start node on, but now we pull from the front of the queue. For example, starting with A, we put on B, C, D, E, and F again, and when we pull B off, we add G and K. But now, we move on to C, putting L and M on, then D, putting N on, and probably M too, unless we're also keeping a set of what's in the queue. This means by the time we've seen all of the first level neighbors, all of the second level neighbors are in the queue. The size of the queue is far larger, O of N to the K. The disadvantage to the depth-first search is going deep may miss a closer solution. If the solution is one neighbor away, but it's the last neighbor, we may search the entire graph before we find it. Additionally, when we find an answer, we need to continue searching for a shorter answer, since the first answer we find may not be shortest. A breadth-first search, on the other hand, will find a shortest answer as soon as possible. Depth first tends to be better for problems where we need to search an entire tree or graph regardless, or if space is limited. BFS is better where space or graph size isn't a concern, and we need the shortest answer. For our problem, we want to use a breadth first search. We're trying to find the shortest answer, and the maximum size of the graph, and therefore the queue, is O of wordless size, which is fine on modern computers. There is a way to harness the advantages of both, but it's not necessary for most interview problems. We'll discuss it in the challenges section. Let's implement the code for breadth first search for this problem. We put the start node in our queue and initialize a backtracking table. When we're done, the backtrack table will let us find the path from the end to start without passing it along throughout. We could generate the entire graph here, but since we have a function to find neighbors, it's not necessary, and since we may not visit a large portion of the graph, we'll save time by not making it. For the search part, while we still have items in our queue, or in other words, nodes to explore, we'll get the front of the queue and find the words that are neighbors to it. For each of those neighbors, if it's not in our backtrack table, meaning we haven't reached it yet, we'll put it in the table and put that neighbor in the queue. Since we're doing breadth-first search, we know that this is the shortest path to this neighbor. We're exploring nodes in order of increasing distance. Afterwards, if we find end in our backtrack table, meaning we now have a path from end to start, we break. At this point, we've either exhausted the graph or we have a path. If end is in backtrack, we have a path. We reconstruct it by starting at the end and repeatedly looking in our backtrack table for the previous node until we find the none that indicates the start node. At that point, we reverse the chain, since it started with the end and ended with the start, and return it. If end wasn't in our backtrack table, then we found no path to it and we return none. We run it, and it works. This solution is solid, and we could stop here. There is one silly trick that I want to show you, but I wouldn't recommend using. We can get rid of this reverse line by swapping the input parameters. If there's a path from start to end, there's also a path from end to start. We can swap the two in the parameter list and get rid of the reverse line, and it works. The path is different, but the same length. I don't recommend actually doing this because it's confusing to the user and probably to other programmers as it is. You could go through and swap end with start everywhere, but that's also confusing. Just leave the reverse in. Here are some further challenges you could consider. In our Finding the Shortest Path video, we discussed Dijkstra's algorithm, which is another way to think of this problem. Try solving this problem using Dijkstra. And while you're at it, you could solve it with A star as well. An interesting problem there is, what could you use as a heuristic? Iterative deepening DFS is a way of getting the best of breadth-first search and depth-first search with a slight time cost. It works by doing depth-first search to a given depth, which you iteratively increase. Try implementing this program with IDDFS, possibly also using recursion. 
Finally, both BFS and DFS have lots of other applications in practice, and you should be familiar with them. I'll put some links in the description, but find some other graph traversal problems in practice. Next time, we're going to do a simpler problem that still has an interesting twist. Take a string and sort it. I hope you got something out of this video. If you have any questions, comments, something I've missed, or problems you want answered or covered, let me know in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more, it would be great if you liked the video, subscribed, or both. I really appreciate it. See you here next time on Coder Snacks.